Greetings, everyone. I am very honored to be back in conversation today with Dr. Elizabeth Satoris. And let me give you a little bit of her background. I'll list her full bio below. But I have such profound respect for your work and I'm really honored to be back in conversation with you again. Hello. <laughs> So she is an internationally known evolution biologist, futurist, speaker, author, and sustainability consultant to businesses, government agencies, and other organizations. She's a member of the Evolutionary Leaders, has taught internationally, has co-convened two international symposia on the foundations of science, and is the author of a number of books, uh, including... Earth Dance, Living Systems in Evolution, a book that changed my life. It was, it's profound. So I'm so glad to be back in conversation with you. And one of the things that I think is profound about you is how your education has been through your experience in nature, through your study of science, but also through your commitment to and relationships with people from indigenous communities. So you're an incredible bridge person and such a, and from my perspective, such a wisdom keeper who's supporting us in this profound time of transition and transformation to remember how we can come back into right relationship with the earth again. But talk to us a little bit about, I mean, a core thesis in your book, Earth Dance, and in your work is this whole understanding of the maturation of species and how we as humanity need to come into our maturity in the ways that other species have. Yes, that's, uh, I think, my, my best discovery in a way, uh, by looking at biological evolution of Earth over its lifetime, over the roughly 4 billion years, um, that's a, it's an easy way to, to get the, the evolution because we only learn in school the last part of it. <laughs> and, the, and the first part of it is called primeval sludge or something like that. And actually that primeval sludge lasted for half of evolution uh, <laughs> because uh, the, the ancient bacteria were the first creatures of earth. And they spend a long time in... <clears throat> developing different lifestyles because they cause global problems. And uh, among those global problems were eating up all the free food, the sugars and acids that were lying around on the surface of the earth. Um, and, and so they caused global hunger. And then they had to reinvent themselves uh, to make food out of what was left, which was just sunlight and sand and water uh, or, or ground. <laughs> and water, um, rocks. Uh, anyway, so that, but, but in the process of then uh, feeding themselves, they were giving off oxygen gas as a waste and they ended up causing global pollution because they were so successful at feeding themselves <laughs> that they, they uh, emitted all these pollution gases. <laughs> and so they had to reinvent themselves again. But what's fascinating to me about that was that those two global problems that they caused are the ones that we have caused. Global hunger and global pollution are both human cause and nothing in between those ancient bacteria and us ever did that. So what, what uh, happened with the bacteria at the end of about these two billion, billion years of being so creative, inventive, electric motors, uh, nuclear piles, all these things that they invented that are in my, my books. Uh, there's an easier book called Gaia's Dance, um, uh, The Story of Earth and Us, which is shorter than the Big Earth Dance book, and but it tells this story, is 
The important matter is that the first huge leap in evolution was halfway through evolution when those bacteria, instead of competing with each other in that competitive creative phase, went into a mature cooperative phase in which they built the only other kind of cell that's ever been invented, which is the kind we're made of, the nucleated cells, as big bacterial cooperatives living side by side with the little individual bacteria in colonies and uh, the actual bacteria were still on earth all along, right? So there was a maturation case, the first one and the biggest leap in evolution, first biggest leap. For another billion years, because those big cells were new, they were competitive and creative and created gazillion different kinds of, uh, of these big nucleated cells. And then they formed their cooperatives just as their bacterial ancestors and inhabitants had originally. So we have at 2 billion years and at 3 billion years of evolution, these two huge lips, leaps again into cooperation because they formed the multi-celled creatures. And that's the part you learn about in school. So we know all the rest of evolution, how they evolved in the seas and onto land and through the dinosaurs and flowers and up to us. So uh, I saw that this still happens in every ecosystem, that you have ecosystems that are full of species that are still competing. And then they move into cooperation so that well worked out, mature ecosystems like prairies and rainforests and uh, grasslands, if they're healthy, uh, that these are, again, you see it there. And then you see it in our own cells, where we are maturation cycles evidence, again, because up until adolescence, our cells are an expansion economy that's, you know, keeps growing new cells and you get bigger and bigger. And then you have to level off into a completely cooperative body that doesn't get bigger anymore. And so look at our human economics and see, ha, we're still in an immature cycle in a youthful phase, trying to move into this mature cooperative phase from our competitive economics. Well, and one of the things that you've written about is how Darwin's theory of evolution is really only charting that immature phase, survival of the fittest, competition, but that our economies have been reflective of that level of maturation. And so we are on a path of destruction if we don't grow up and mature and move into more cooperation and collaboration and community with each other. So it's profound in terms of your, your scientific attunement to that really parallels the astrological understanding of what it means to move into the Aquarian age, which is all about honoring diversity collaboration, compassion, community. So it's the the earth and the stars, the sky are all trying to guide us in this evolutionary leap that we need to take at this time. But one of the one of the things you also talk a lot about is that indigenous wisdom that's held on to that awareness of what it means to be a part of the oneness, to be in connection, in collaboration with the sacredness of life around us. Yes, and uh, it's interesting because our United States Constitution, of course, was written on Haudenosaunee territory, <laughs> the, the Indians that were here, and uh, Ben Franklin, one of our founding fathers, uh, got close to the Indians, understood their ways, and tried to get his fellows to put some of their great law of peace, where they had un unified six warring nations a long time ago, um, and had uh, they, they had a formulated great law of peace on how to stay cooperative and run your society. 
And they came closest to anything called a democracy I've ever seen on the planet. And it's interesting because I recently read a book uh, by a woman who showed that the very earliest women talking about how they wanted equality with men and stuff were doing it because they noticed that the, that the Indians, you know, there was a lot written in broadsheets and things like that that were available about the Indians. And, and the early women got wind of, wow, they treat their women awfully well. <laughs> and, you know, they the women chose the chiefs and could take them back out of power if they weren't serving their people and all those things. So the, the Council founding, of Grandmothers. <laughs> the Council of Grandmothers, exactly. And uh, so, and they took all their decisions into, uh, is this good for, for us and for our families, for our communities, for our nation, and, and seven years into the future, seven generations into the future, they really had this long perspective and were very cautious and careful not to destroy things in nature and to make sure that everything was always replenished. And uh, so, you know, nothing much of the only thing that got into our constitution was their checks and balances, the tripartite government, which they had initiated in their own government. So, but for me, it's very interesting because more and more I'm seeing this difference between understanding the world through indigenous eyes, you know, because all indigenous people uh, had sciences. They, you know, they knew astronomy and, and biology and, and, uh, Agro agronomy and medicine and all of those things, but they never, you know, counted things up in numbers. They didn't, they mm -hmm. didn't have a mechanical worldview where you measure everything with physical instruments and come up with numbers and build models and connect dots and things like that, because they knew how interconnected everything was. And they could exchange information directly with plants and animals through communion. Um, they could watch what, you know, what medicinal plants grew by seeing what the animals took when they had belly aches and stuff. Uh, and what I, I'm seeing this coming up in our culture a lot now, like a, a recent um, debate at Oxford University that I watched online, between George Monbiot who, and, in a, and, and Alan Savory. George Monbiot has long been a, an ecologist and evolutionist, and, um, uh, but he's very into scientism, as I call it, where everything can only be measured. It has to be measured in numbers. And the, the debate was about whether Alan Savory's work in restoring grasslands around the planet that had desertified was helping with global warming issues or not. And Alan was only presenting the work of, that he does of restoring hoofed animals onto desertified grasslands because the only way that they can survive the dry seasons uh, where the soil bacteria die and the grass dies and everything is just, you know, goes to desert, unless you have the hoofed animals that have always evolved on grasslands that break up the clumps of grass and eat the dry grass and then poop out very bacteria rich fertilizer that gets the grass growing again. Well, Alan didn't work with numbers, and George Monbiot only said, you have to prove to me how much carbon you're sequestering in the ground when you do this. And that is not what Alan does. He doesn't measure it. Now, uh, if you've ever followed Nora Bateson, the daughter of Gregory Bateson, she talks about warm data. And warm data is all the information that is not measurable. Yes. And it's what indigenous cultures use to get their information. They use warm data. They observe. 
what each species does and they know how it looks and they can tell gazillion species of bees apart and stuff. But they don't try to measure these interactions because you cannot measure all the interactions of a world that's so complexly interwoven, right? Everything like in your body. You can't measure what's going on in your body except for very crude measurements like your heart rate, your brain waves with you put an electrode on it. Yes, you can me medicine measures a lot of things about the body, but it can never capture the essence of life and the way everything in it communes, how every cell knows its place in the organ how every individual cell negotiates with that organ, individual and community, constantly in negotiation, like in ecosystems, like life. Yes. And so the, these two people, you know, they, they couldn't, Monbiot would get angry and furious that, that Savory couldn't come up with the numbers and could only say, well, look at how green it is. <laughs> You know, it's so extraordinary about that. And you talk about it in different ways in your writing. But from my background as a neuropsychologist, that's right brain ways of knowing versus left brain ways of knowing. And in ancient cultures, we were right brain dominant. And that right brain perspective is about seeing things in their wholeness and seeing things from that more integrative understanding. But in the last four to 5,000 years, we've been, modern cultures have been left brain dominant, which is that orientation of separation, linear thinking, wanting to quantify everything. And you talk about this a lot in terms of that materialistic scientific perspective that is breaking everything down and, and discounting the holistic interconnectedness of everything discounting the importance of consciousness and for the ancient cultures consciousness is the source of what manifests in our world mm -hmm. that everything is a manifestation of the earth's consciousness of cosmic consciousness it's a part of the oneness and it feels like that's part of the shift that we need to make as humanity is rebalancing our left brain ways of knowing that are trying to quantify everything with the right brain ways of knowing that understand the qualities of everything and interconnectedness of everything. Yes, that's, that's what always fascinated me about astrology, you know, from the time I, I was <laughs> convinced to look into it because I was calling it Bunk, and somebody said, you, you can't criticize something you know nothing about. <laughs> and, and the challenge was learn how to make a chart and stuff. And astrology is about patterns. It's about detecting patterns. Yes. And, and it's that's what the nearness of things, the closeness, the brushes, the, uh, the interactions, you know, it's... Uh, the correspondences, uh, that the, hermetic understanding as above, so below. Yes. That everything is mirroring everything else. Yeah, yeah. It's energy. It's patterns. Yes. And and you've been tracking, you know, what what's happening in our world now. And I'm curious about the, the, the sudden, what I just read, that we've just had the hottest weeks in 120,000 years <laughs> since before the last ice age. Uh, um, how, how, does, how is it looking? Is that heating up and drying up and wetting and, you know, the, that stuff showing up? Well, absolutely. What's really fascinated me from an astrological perspective are these larger cycles. And one of my areas of specialty is the processional cycle. That is that 24,000 year cycle where we track the movement of the constellations rising at the time of spring equinox mm -hmm. and how at critical times in the processional cycle, particularly at the beginning and ending of a processional cycle where we are now, and at the midpoint, which is 
the last midpoint would have been 12,000 years ago, we experience profound earth changes and a profound time of shifting in human consciousness. So 12,000 years ago was the, the ending of the last ice age and all of that cataclysmic change on the earth plane and the time of a radical shift in humanity and we're there again. And I think how we work with the shifts in our consciousness will have a profound impact on how we're either in a process with the earth of transformation and healing or a cataclysmic reset. And one of, one of your quotes that I absolutely loved was in one of your articles you wrote, we are all co-creators in a planetary improv theater production. We each have a role and we each have a choice. And I think that's where we are now. And astrologically, Pluto is squaring the lunar nodes saying, this is a karmic choice point. Do we, South Node in Libra, come back into balance and move into new ways of being? Or are we going to be in a time of a cataclysmic reset? But how we work with our consciousness and the choices that we make will have a profound impact on that outcome. Yes, absolutely. It's, you know, our culture has has uh, cultivated individualism uh, to an extreme degree. And as I as I've said, you know, the, the Soviet Union sacrificed the individual to community, but capitalism sacrificed the community community to the individual. Right? So we we need to bring individual and community back together. And so what each of us does is supremely important. You know, we are the world from a unique perspective. It's like Indra's net, that wonderful image of all the different uh, pearls that make up the net of the universe. And each pearl reflects all of the others. And so each pearl is vital to the whole thing. But it mustn't get lost in either individualism only or community only. There has to be this constant negotiation. And when you have uh, this kind of inflection point on a, on the maturation cycle, the old the 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 youthful system has to give way. It's like in the in the chrysalis, uh, the butterfly. The, the caterpillar has to disintegrate so that the uh, so that the butterfly can be built from the same cells and from the stem cells that have been held in the the new information that have been held in the skin of the caterpillar all along can now come out like stem cells in research and form the different parts of the butterfly so uh, it's not about ashes, you know, everything collapsing, and then somehow the phoenix mag magically rises from the ashes. It's the building of the butterfly as the caterpillar dissolves. And that's where we are, because right. it's a whole different blueprint, right? <laughs> the, and and the, those stem cells held the new blueprint. So what we're seeing is that if we're going to build a caring and sharing culture that we all know is the mature way, and remember that parents, all parents tell their children, be nice, share your toys, don't hit anybody, don't call them names, don't take things away from each other. And that, of course, is what they should be teaching the children. But are they role modeling it? As soon as the kids get to watch TV or TikTok nowadays or whatever, to, you get your information. You see that the grownups are all calling each other names, taking things away from each other and hitting each other. Uh, so we have to go through this maturation cycle. And so we have to use the new blueprint. And I like to say what I learned from Polynesian sailors, stand tall in your canoe 
uh, the Polynesian sailors were so great at reaching all, reading all of the signs of nature from the sticking their legs down in the water to feel the direction of the swells and seeing the seaweed and the fish patterns and the clouds that form over islands and uh, you know when the stars fail because they knew all those star patterns inside out and so they say when all else fails stand tall in your canoe until you can see your destination and I say when you feel like you're at the bottom of a black well because everything is falling apart around you take your consciousness up high and look down on this human drama as though it's playing out on a stage. And you watch, you discern what's happening. You see, oh my goodness, this big economy is crumbling and that's happening all over the world. And meanwhile, there are fires and floods and all these things going on. And oh, here are some people that are building organic farm and there's a whole network of eco villages. And oh, all these people in... Sri Lanka are feeding each other and lifting each other out of poverty. And there in Spain, they have this urban co cooperative going. And, oh, hey, there's a friend of mine, you know, she's doing this, writing this new play and they're performing it. And it's all about how to make a better world. And, you know, find, take something that what you love doing, whether you're an artist or a computer repair person or a politician type or whatever, and look to see where people who like doing the same things you like doing are congregating to form community and build something new and different from the ground up in the cracks of the crumbling when the sidewalk starts to crack and all the plants are popping up. That's kind of the world we're in now. So everybody can find something to do to contribute uh, in that Sri Lanka situation, they teach little kids to meditate on just two things, inner peace and generosity. Mm. Imagine a world where everybody is a peaceful person and they're all thinking about what do I have to give? What can I give? What can I give? And nobody would ever be in want in that kind of a situation, right? Well, and part of what you're talking about that's so profound and is so much the meaning of the Aquarian age that we're moving into is how do we honor our individual gifts, but bring it into collaboration, into community, and that the change will come from the grassroots. It's not going to come from a powered mm -hmm. over model, that the patriarchal model is crumbling. But I love your image of that process of metamorphosis of the caterpillar to the butterfly, that part of it, I think, is rather than get caught in fear around what is falling apart, we need to, as you said, see the bigger picture of what's unfolding so that we can allow the dissolving, which is then setting the stage for the new birth of the new form that is about coming back into the remembrance of our interconnectedness. But we can't get there if we get caught in fear and then try to cling to the old forms. We need to let those die in order for this transition into the new way of being to emerge. Yeah, I've, I've often said we need to celebrate crisis because every crisis is an opportunity. In the, the old Chinese symbol for it showed that it's only all through evolution, all the interesting new developments in evolution happen when, when there's a crisis, you know, when, oh my goodness, we can't live here anymore. We have to move somewhere else. Or 95% uh, uh, of life is, has just been shattered by a meteor hitting the earth and changing the climate so dramatically. And then what happens to 5% that are left? Say, whoopee, we can redesign and do you know, the field. Well, the earth comes back in more diversity. The, more diversity springs up again and again and again. And, you know, humans have done huge mistakes by inventing monocultures, which don't exist anywhere in nature. No matter how barren the landscape looks, how frozen, how whatever, if you dig into it, you'll find a gazillion different kinds of life forms, right? 
Diversity is the name of the game and resilience is the name of the game. You have to be resilient. If you build a rigid structure, it will collapse. Right? Uh, a palm tree, you know, during tsunamis, they say grab a palm tree if you can, because it will sway and break won't break, whereas the other kinds of trees will snap off. A bomb tree will just bend with the wind. And so uh, I remember one of my Mao Zedong quotes a long time ago was, the tree would prefer calm, but the wind will not subside. <laughs> I, always thought, mm. I quoted that some, somewhere and got accused of being a communist for it. <laughs> <laughs> That's a great quote. It was actually in the 1970s when we were all wearing mini skirts, and and I appeared in the in the Washington Post, I think, in the newspaper as a mini skirted Maoist. <laughs> <laughs> oh, that's great. I wonder if I put that one into my book. I just finished my last book. <laughs> Ah. and uh, had a great gift. I was terrible at formatting it. And uh, so I, I, I suddenly got this wonderful gift of somebody who said, oh, just give me the whole manuscript and I will turn it into a publishable book. And I said, wow, and what am I going to do with this book now? And you know what I really want to do, Heather? I just want to give it away. Oh wow! I just want to give it away, and I, uh, I, I need. I'm going to work on finding a way to do that. Maybe post it on my website or somewhere. I give my books away anyway, you know. And I, it's never been my way of making a living, because um, I can't market myself. I can market other people's books, but not my own. Tell us about this book. And the the book is called Vista which is a worldview, uh, you know, when you have a, a great big vista, a worldview. And the reason I love that Latin word is because it's made of two smaller words, two four-letter words that are pushed together. And those two, think about it, V-I-S-T-A, you've got vita and visa pushed together. Vita is life and a visa gets you where you want to go. So wow. my sub, my subtitle at Vista is life and getting where you want to be. <laughs> oh, so I love it. it's uh and and I'm uh, as I've mentioned to you, I'm off on a trip to Estonia where uh, a fan base was built there over my book Earth Dance that you mentioned changed your life and and I have a couple of indigenous people who said their lives were changed by that book. Because they didn't know that a Western scientist could be, that, that indigenous science could live side by side with Western science, you know, that uh, we needed different kinds of sciences. And anyway, uh, the, the, because the book is about my worldview, it, due to a, a wonderful lady named Betty Sue Flowers, who told me, you can't write another expositional book Elizabeth, you have to tell the story of your own intellectual development, spiritual and intellectual development over time. So it's not a normal autobiography. It's just a whole big set of stories of, of what changed me along the way, my own evolution as an evolution biologist and futurist in service to humanity. So I think there are some good stories in it. Yeah. Uh, well, and part of what you've talked about is the in in some of your other writing is the power of story, and also how our stories reflect our cosmology. And I think part of what you're describing in this book is your own journey of how your own cosmology, your own understanding of of the world, and that and those paradigms changed over time. And that's some of what I think is so profound in your work is you're such a bridge builder of really bringing these ancient wisdom traditions and indigenous understandings into integration with modern science in a way that they don't have to be in conflict with each other. Exactly. There's, there's so much 
beauty in that, you know, when we can weave together so many things in diversity and stop doing these silly monocultures that have gotten us into such bad trouble. In fact, you know, when when we first, one of the Estonian novels is about uh, people living in hunter-gatherers back in the Stone Age, uh, snooping into the first towns that get built, that cut out of the forest and leveled, trees are cut down, and and this kind of grass is growing in in by around these villages uh, that that they're making a new food out of, and it's called bread, and and they get a hold of some of it and they say ah. It, like sticks to your mouth and it's like weird, weird, pale stuff, <laughs> pale gummy stuff <laughs> isn't very good. And they catch on to something very interesting because they recognize that the people in the towns have become serfs who are working for somebody who owns this land that this wheat is being grown on, this grain. The power over model. Yeah, and I thought that was fascinating that this that this novel about the Stone Age had perceived the effect of agriculture in fencing off things, land, and then ownership of land, and then people who have to work for whoever owns the land. And that got us onto this whole track of dividing the world up into spaces owned by different countries and landholders and people and making boundaries that scratch right through, you know, indigenous territories that, that weren't bounded the same way um, as our, we, they didn't put up fences, they didn't try to own nature. And so can we, is there some human future that we can make where our communities are settled according to watersheds? The way on, I live on an island and the island, the way they used to divide the farms was every farm went from the forested crest of, of the highest points in the island, the ridge where the mountain was, you know, and the, the streams coming down the mountain made the boundaries between the farms so that every farm had the timber on top and the fields in the middle and then the seafood uh, on, the, on the coast. Uh, you know, they had all, so each farm had the complete diet available to it. And that is now called bioregionalism, where you settle according to watersheds. And wow. you know, and you can find how many people can live in this watershed without wrecking it. You know, and so you adjust your populations to the different kinds of watersheds. Um, so there are so many things that we can learn from the old cultures that were so, you know, equitable yes. uh, without being everybody being alike. They had divisions of labor. They had their canoes would have to have the female carving on one end and the male carving on the other before they could push it out into the water because the balance had to be there. Balancing um, the polarities, yes. Yeah, and, mm -hmm. and the men would, in the Haudenosaunee culture, the men were taming the animals and making friends with them so that they could commune and an animal would volunteer, literally, to be hunted. And the women were growing the corn, bean, squash, three sisters kind of agriculture and tending the home fires. And, you know, so they had divisions of labor and a chief and, and somebody who wasn't a chief were not the same. They, you know, there were different roles in the society, but they weren't considered, I'm more important than you are. Every voice was always held in the dialogues, the way our Quakers, for instance, hold meetings. Right? Well, where every voice gets heard. And it's, it's mirroring the biodiversity of healthy ecosystems, where every person every life form is needed but they're all part of a community and yes. you know this whole notion that you're talking about about communion that is that ancient understanding and and truly in ancient times i do believe we were telepathic and knew how to be Absolutely. in 
connection with and communion with the plants and animals. Um, but you've talked about communion only as absolute equals can we be spoken to each other by the universe. Yeah, that's that comes from the book Kinship with All Life by J. Allen Boone, where he he Boone was known as the St. Francis of Hollywood uh, because of his love of animals. And, and uh, he was actually a journalist who traveled around the world um, and, and had fabulous adventures all over. But he, there was a point at which Hollywood had looked for the most intelligent dog in the world, you know, and they'd gotten this, this uh, German police dog trained as a German police dog that, that was super intelligent. And he was super intelligent. But uh, he, a wonderful trainer named Larry Trimble undid the conditioning of this police dog to bring out what he called his natural dogality, you know, his <laughs> mm, true nature. To yeah, to allow him to be his real true self to get and isn't that an interesting metaphor for the rigid training, the rules, the the, the aggressiveness situation. that had been taught to the dog on melting that down so that the dog can be a beautiful being and at one point Trimble went away and had that's a new thought to me about that book I love that book I've given it to so many young people uh kids from the age of of 12 up or so you know should be reading this book because what happens is that Boone gets to take care of the dog for six weeks while Trimble is away and so he is so enamored of this dog that he decides to become the humble pupil of the dog and do everything on the dog's schedule. If the dog wants to run, I run with him. If the dog wants to eat, we eat then. If he wants to sleep, I take a nap, you know, like that. And one day sitting on a high cliff overlooking the Pacific, he's uh, sitting behind the dog is looking out over the water and Boone is sitting behind him saying, I wonder if he's looking at above or below the horizon. And is he everything? And, you know, his mind is chattering about what is the dog doing? And the dog suddenly turns around and looks him directly in the eye <laughs> and then goes back to what he was doing. And Boone said in that instant, every question he had had in his mind had been answered. Wow. Oh, wow. You know what happened? And then he learns how to set up this mental bridge between himself and the dog so that the communion between them can flow, that it can become a two way thing. And he found that every time he tried to elevate his end of the bridge, like, well, I'm a man after all, and you're a dog, whoop, the flow stopped. Wow. So there was the equality was. It would only work that way. And he said, we ended up spending hours a day in deep conversation, not as man and dog talking to each other, but as the universe, allowing the universe to talk us to each other. Wow. So what in your picture again, you know. <laughs> and I love how you talked about the dog coming back into its true nature and releasing all that cultural conditioning. That's what we exactly. humans need exactly to do. Exactly what we need. And remember who we truly are and what we're capable of and how to come back into that communion again. Yes. And, it, and, and it's when you have these meetings like the Quaker meeting where every voice is heard and that's how indigenous meetings go all night long if necessary. And eventually... You as the individual who said, but I want it this way, will melt down a little and see that you can't always have your individual way. Some You have to give way so that you and the community can be healthy. And that's what happens when you hear all the voices. You allow everybody to tell their story. And, and that way, the group gets these different perspectives in a speaking world, right? in a language world where you use communication rather than communion, but you also build the energy field of communion in that process. And you recognize that why would you want to get your way if it wasn't 
helping the rest of the community. And but so what can I as a unique individual contribute here that is good for my community, that's accepted, that's loved? I get loved for certain things that I can do for my community. And if I'm stepping out of line, I want to know that, you know, I don't want to harm the community. And this is this is the beauty of what we can take into the future through this very difficult time, this this bottleneck. We have to allow celebrate the fact that the old world is crumbling Mm, because it has not served us well mm. in many in in too many ways. It count the blessings that we did get from it and see how many of those we can take with us can protect. And that's, you know, in a real democracy, if you, I, uh, it's speaking truth to nature by getting all your politics and economics from nature is wonderful because nobody argues with you. <laughs> and, <laughs> and you can say, look, nature is profoundly conservative with things that work and radically changes the things that don't work. You don't vote on that every four years. You do that 24-7. So the top leadership has to reflect both sides, both parties somehow. Now, in Britain, they in in the UK, they actually tried it once. They had a co-leadership of the two heads of parties, and it didn't work. Why? Because nobody below them was trained to understand that balance and cooperation. The parties were still at each other's throats. You know, and and the two people ended up trying to, you know, keep the peace somehow in their own world. So we have to train. We have to live up to what we teach our children. We have to. <laughs> yeah, and the other piece of that, I think, is that, I mean, you talk about the Quaker community and what it means to really honor being in collaborative community. But I was also thinking, as you were talking about that, about Uh, my training in the sacred circle or council format that comes out of indigenous cultures, where part of what you're doing is you sit in circle and you hold this awareness that, that our circle is more than the sum of the parts, that there is the spirit of the circle, the wholeness of the circle, the, our interconnectedness with all that is. So that when we speak into the circle, we each hold a part of the whole. So it's not about competition in order to, you know, come to some consensus. It's how how do I find my unique truth that I give in service to the circle that is what we weave together to understand the wholeness of who we are as a community to then really honor what is really in all, the highest good for all of us. It's really, again, holding that understanding of our interconnectedness and our wholeness in, in relationship with each other, but with everything else around us. Exactly. I mean, look at your, your own body, 50 trillion cells. You know, we're only about 8 billion humans. <laughs> um 50 trillion cells are, is your heart trying to get the other organs to be hearts? Is your, <laughs> you know, like. It's great. We're uh, competing with the liver and saying, <laughs> really, I'm better. <laughs> yeah, right. I mean, I mean, you know, obviously intestines are the way to go, you know. It's <laughs> <laughs> great. Uh, you know, it's it's so crazy. You know, do you want the rainbow to to melt down into just one grayness, brownness, if you mix all the colors in, in the vat, uh, or do you like having that distinction, that diversity? And the greatest creativity always comes out of the most diverse groups. Um, yes. So yeah. we uh, stop doing monoculture and uh, ownership, and I'm better than you are, you know, patriarchal hierarchy, and think holarchy instead. And and always, you know, I've called myself a context chaser. And I think that's what Nora Bateson means when when she talks about uh, 
what was her word for it? Trans, trans contextual uh, to me is just building another contact. And I, I, as I've said often, like a rose is not a rose is a rose is a rose. A rose is very different depending on the context and who's looking at it. Uh, is a rose the same to a donkey and a lover and a perfume <laughs> manufacturer? Uh, yeah. <laughs> right, or a butterfly, or <laughs> <Yes>. <laughs> you know, and I want to circle back a minute to what you said a minute ago because it felt so profound that in the midst of this profound time of change, we need to celebrate that we are in this transition and not get caught in fear because the fear constricts us mm -hmm. and then we tend to want to cling to what's familiar. But if we can celebrate this larger unfolding that we're in and the transition that we're in, then we can release these old forms, the power over structures, the patriarchal, hierarchical systems, and be in the liminal time of not knowing to open to the new forms like the caterpillar becoming the butterfly. And then instead of coming from fear, I think part of what you're also talking about is coming back into our connection with each other and all that is from a place of love and compassion and honoring mutual respect, harmony, right relationship that then allows everyone to thrive and everything to thrive. Yeah, yeah. I, I have a favorite cartoon of, of uh, two caterpillars looking up at a butterfly and then one says to the other, you'll never get me up in one of those. <laughs> <laughs> I ain't I going to do that. Right? <laughs> um, because that's a fear mode, isn't it? <laughs> I want to stay the way I am. <laughs> that newfangled thing there, that ooh, ah. <laughs> <laughs> but, so, but really we have so the true. To, that, to really um, and and that's it, you know. Love. I've I have a friend who lives multidimensionally who who just taught me that we're the creative edge of God, if you like. Uh, mm. For those inclined to name it God by many names, but it me and I, and I have given sermons in churches, and I've said, imagine that God is looking through your eyes and working through your hands, walking on your feet, you know, can we live in a way that we truly love and honor each other all as different pearls in Indra's net, whatever you want to call it. Suddenly, you know, if you look at the person you think is the most vile and evil person in the world, Take them back to infancy for a minute and hold them and, and, and wonder what happened to make them grow up the way they did, to do the things that they did. Didn't they too start out as an embryo growing in a mom? What was that mom doing while they were in the womb? Who knows, you know, but take it back. Take it back to where you can feel some compassion and then say, well, they have taught us some serious lessons with that lifetime. Who knows, but why they might not be a very high level soul agreed to incarnate to play that nasty role. Mm -hmm. So always it goes back to what you were talking about earlier, Heather, that you look at the big cycles, look at the big picture and take all those contexts, that, that's holarchy, nested mm -hmm. dolls, you know, cells within organs, within a body, within a community, within an ecosystem, planet, galaxy. Oneness. <laughs> yeah. yeah. It's all one and it's also beautifully diversified. And here we are just one precious jewel and, you know, among so many. And I've, I've had the great pleasure of being called into so many different contexts in my life to speak from fashion to religion, science, uh, government, um, just, I can't even, you know, women's evolution, uh, 
it's a, been a hugely diverse uh, experience for me. And I've had the good fortune to run around the planet and live cross-culturally and drop my realize I had to drop my assumptions about how things are. And that inter, that then would play into looking at the assumptions of a science and that it, how a different science can be built on different assumptions. Every culture has cultural assumptions. When I was living in Greece, I used to go nuts sometimes about things like, why do you promise a child something and then not fulfill the promise and all that? And or why did you tell it to go to bed? And then when it comes out, you you, you talk to it again. And, <laughs> and all the things that they were doing were preparing their young people for the adult culture, which worked. It was a living culture and it worked but it didn't work on the same assumptions that that we do. <laughs> my, my Greek husband once promised, uh, I, I think, three different people that we would come to their house for dinner on Friday night. And I'd say, which room are we going to go to? You've promised three different people. He said, how do I know? It's not Friday yet. <laughs> <laughs> but so, you know, I had to learn a lot. <laughs> But that's some of what's so profound, I think, is how you have been such a, a bridge person moving between these different cultures, these different contexts, and seeing that each one has its value, each one has its perspective. And again, as you were saying a minute ago, I think that's the key is to let go of polarization and our judgments of each other and come back into mutual respect and curiosity to yes. explore and understand each other's perspectives instead of mm -hmm. judging them or distancing ourselves from them. Can we walk in each other's moccasins, as the Indians say? Yeah. Can you put yourself into that other person's shoes? And some of the best, you know, I think um, conflict resolution should be the most revered job in a, in society. <laughs> and and uh, who's the wonderful conflict resolution getting to yes? Um, I can't think of his name right now. But he he did some demonstrations for us when we were uh, in in meeting with the Dalai Lama, and in between meetings with the Dalai Lama, he would work on things like conflict, teaching us conflict resolution, and how you stand in somebody else's shoes, and how you get the whole audience to be with each speaker as they're speaking in a debate, right, and just give your wholehearted support and attention to each person talking as they talk not you've already you're just trying to decide which one's going to win the debate or which one side am I on but can you truly understand both sides can you truly hear both the conservative and the change agent and then in our government could we look at each issue and say is this something working for us that we want to protect or is this something not working that we want to change? And then those people who are inclined to be protectors or those people who are inclined to like changing things can take the role for that issue. And you see that as a cooperative. It must be a cooperative. It cannot and, be an antagonism. Yeah. And a key, I think, in what you just said is, the, is, is remembering the art of listening. I loved, you know, in, in one of your articles, you talk about uh, being with this indigenous teacher and asking, how do I learn how to speak to the animals? And he said, you don't speak, you listen. And then yeah, he's actually he said, shut up, Elizabeth, and listen, because this con <laughs> this conversation's been going on as long as the forest has been here. It's not your job to initiate it, it's your job <laughs> to hear it first. <laughs> but if we had that orientation with each other as well as with the natural exactly. world. Exactly. Yeah. Listen yeah. and be in yeah. relationship, yeah. Yeah. it would change everything. Anyway, I hope lots more people go into conflict resolution. We sh it should be a highly paid profession. <laughs> uh, and, you know, of course, we don't te pay teachers well. Or <laughs> we have our 
our priorities pretty mixed up and uh, not necessarily in, in, in good society. I hope we don't have to pay people for anything. I hope we just do things yeah. for and with each other. Well, and as as we're closing, I think some of what you're talking about that's so important is 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 the consciousness with which we come back into that communion and connection with each other and community and collaboration and really honor this change process that we're in. And I think part of that will lead us into economies that are based more on gratitude and honoring each other's gifts rather than turning everything into commodities. That part of, I think, we have to remember when we come back into our interconnectedness that we each have an individual gift to offer to the community, to offer to the world. And when we can hold that with gratitude and respect, then we're no longer in competition and trying to you turn everything into a commodity. You know, competition originally in the ancient Greek sense was only about excellence. The only reason that you pit people against each other in a sport is to further excellence. And mm -hmm. I, I don't, did I talk last time about the basketball game in China? No. Uh, in, in 1973, I was at a basketball game in China and my host leaped up and cheered at the first basket. And I said, oh, good. Now I know which team to cheer for. But the next basket was made by the other team. And he got up with equal enthusiasm and cheered again. And I, I was so confused that after the game through the interpreter, I said, I don't understand which team was yours. And he said, what do you mean mine? And, and I said, well, which team did you want to win? He said, how, how did I know which one would win? And eventually <laughs> we got through this and he explained, no, no, no. The reason two teams are playing the game is to drive excellence. And so we cheer all of the points made on both sides. And then uh, I said, oh, my gosh, what if we did this in schools and we let the we didn't say anything to the coach and the team players, the coaches, the two coaches and the team players. But we coached the audience, the parents and the bleachers before the game. Tonight, you're going to cheer excellence, every point made on both sides. And at the end of the game, the winning team is going to have to give a party to the other team to thank them for driving them to the extra excellence. Oh, wow. So it's about everybody winning and supporting each other in their gifts instead of a win-lose problem. And still having competition only to drive excellence. Mm, beautiful. Okay. Beautiful. So, and nobody goes home crying. And you have to make the party for the other. <laughs> they can't cry because the party's in their honor, right? <laughs> Beautiful. So these are the little shifts. You know, it's it's like you've just turned a little switch in, in your head and suddenly, oh, wow, why didn't I think of that? Right? <laughs> but it is a paradigm shift so that we're no longer thinking about a scarcity model or right. when. Exactly. But no fear, no scarcity, thrive. no losing, none of those fears. Yeah, it's how and, do we all thrive? Yeah. How do we all thrive together? Exactly. Because, and, and we, we can end here, but one of the things that you talk so much about in Earth Dance is in this model of moving into maturation, it's no longer about a survival mentality it becomes about thriving and that that really is what we could be moving into together. And it's about thriving and thriving in a world of disaster. Um, it's again, it's not, not an either or thing. It's a both and you, you don't cover it up that things are breaking down. You don't cover it up that things are heating up or flooding or whatever. You look into it, you say, how interesting. Why is the weather pattern doing? Oh, because the polar shift is, is, is the, the um, polar vortex has been so 
damp down that that the whole the wind belts between the cold and the warm air are floppy now they're not going around the planet neatly and they're flopping so far down that there's snow in texas and in florida itself and then they're flopping up so high that there's you know heat up here in the north where we didn't have it before and you say okay so what are we going to do about that? How are we going to look for our water supply to keep going? How are we? I mean, the Indian rights to to the big river in, in that go, flows through California and to the into the Gulf of Mexico, um, or into the Baja, what do you go down yep. there? Uh, that river that hardly gets there anymore because all the water is used up along the way. And a couple of big companies have taken all the water away from the Indians who had technically on paper the rights to it. So we we mustn't sweep under the rug these things, but we can say, what can we do to be helpful to them? What can we do to in, to ensure that we have food supplies? That are we growing our own food in a healthy way instead of you know all the toxins that go into this separation of plants and animals? Two problems from one of nature's solutions to keep them together, feeding each other in harmony. So don't don't sweep under the rug the disasters that are happening, but meditate or whatever you have to do to calm yourself down saying this is the life i'm in this is the life that i have in what's still a beautiful planet gratitude for being on this planet and preparation for disasters how can i help it's just all move together and and continually think about who is my community? What is my local community? What is my global community? And how do we... And how do we come back into harmony? And how, how do we come back into harmony and play the chords that resolve in the end of the piece? There's always a resolution of the chord into a chord, not into one note. Yeah. Um, and how do we make those changes and be in harmony and collaboration with each other in that grassroots way, not looking for someone to rescue us, right. but making those choices wherever we are to be living that new paradigm. Beautiful. Where can I serve? <laughs> Thank you for all that you're doing and emanating that, that new paradigm and being such a healer and bridge person for us in this time it's what we double aquarians do heather <laughs> <laughs> we're all catching up to you <laughs> well, thank you thank you so much my pleasure aloha everyone blessings everyone butterflies <laughs>